now. Come on, somebody, open your mouth and just worship him in this atmosphere. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The word eulogy means to speak well of, and we are so accustomed to speaking well of people when they die, but we serve a God who cannot die. So I would like for us to eulogize him in this atmosphere. Speak well of him now. Come on, open your mouth. Hallelujah. Perk up when he hears your praise. Open your mouth and let it flow. Hallelujah. Wonderful Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to you.
Your kingdom come and your will be done. Dark. Be dark. Hear Spirit of God. Spirit of God. Of God. Oh God. We need your presence. Welcome Jubilee City Church friends, family, those that are tuning in for the first time. We are so happy that you are joining us today and I pray that you enjoyed that praise and that worship. How important it is for us to take time out of our day to give God what he's so worthy of, our praise and our worship. Whether you are worshiping with your tea group or you're at home watching, you're with family watching, wherever you are, I pray that you are able to engage and connect and take a moment to give God praise and worship. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for tuning in. And momentarily, we'll give you an opportunity to continue your worship with giving your tithes and your offerings. But first, just a few announcements. 
Okay, family, next Sunday, November 21st, we will be in person, live, experiencing God's glory together with one another. So let's gather around, let's come together at the Joy Manor, 1030 AM, 28999 Joy Road in Westland, Michigan, and let's have an awesome time in God's presence. Can you believe the holiday season is upon us? Where did the year go? It is time, once again, to mark your calendars, December 19th, 2021, for our annual Christmas celebration. Jubilee City Church will be coming together to have dinner at 3 o'clock on December 19th. And it's going to be in the main ballroom of the Laurel Park Holiday Inn. The address there is 17123 Laurel Park Drive, Livonia, Michigan 48152. While there is no charge to attend the dinner, you must have a ticket for the dinner portion so that we can determine how many to prepare for. Free tickets will be available in our service starting next Sunday at the Joy Men. Secondly, this is exciting. Mark your calendars for December 5th, 2021. We will be hosting the ministry of Randy Bixby in our regular worship service at the Joy Manor at 1030 a.m. Randy and his wife, Leslie, will be sharing their passion on transforming lives and shaping culture from the inside out. Randy is the founder and the executive director of a ministry called Cultural Architects. And under that ministry, they've developed the Family Reformation Project. Now, that's something that's close to my heart. I am in great anticipation for what God is going to do through this ministry gift and more information will be coming. So please be on the lookout for that. And now let us worship our God with our tithes, offerings, and gifts of love. There are three primary ways to give. Tithely, pay simple, and our cash app is dollar sign Jubilee City Church. Imagine this church, the ecclesia, being who we've called to be, and being able to really help and make an impact in our church and our community. Imagine a family suffering a loss and the church being able to cover those burial expenses or for the single mom, maybe be providing a car or a home. The church being in position to meet the needs of the people. That's what I'm praying and believing God for and I hope that you are there with me. That's what your seat does when you're obedient to God and his word, what he's already laid out, giving back our first fruit. It's not a debt. It's not another bill that we pay, but it's something we get to do. Honoring God with our tithes and our offerings. And, and even as he whispers and moves in us and, and tells us and speaks to us to give whatever amount, it's not about the size. It's about the sacrifice and it's about the condition of our hearts when we're giving. So let me pray. Let me bless those that are being obedient and giving of their tithes and offerings. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that we are even in position to give. Again, it's not about the size, but every time you open a door, every time a seed, income, money it comes into us, God, we give back our tithe, that 10%, as well as an offering, because we're so grateful for all that you do. And we know that when we sow that, God, you blow our minds. You give us more than we can even imagine. And we're, we're proclaiming that. We're asking for that more than our storehouse, more than Jubilee City Church can even hold. We'll be looking for people, putting out referrals for people that need, that have a need that the church can assist them with. God, we claim it. We thank you for it. And we pray and we thank you that those that are giving are blessed in the name of Jesus. Now let's go right into the word. A couple weeks ago, our apostle Ellis L. Smith was in Tampa, Florida, where he preached a powerful word that really blessed the people that were present. And we're going to share that with you today. After the video that's going to be played, the next voice you will hear is our very own apostle. So get ready, get ready, and I pray your hearts are open to receive a word from the Lord. 
Those of you that are viewing worldwide, to my guest speaker, Apostle Ellis Smith, he's going to share with you the word of the Lord. Prepare your hearts and minds. God is about to bless you, Apostle Smith. Bless you, man of God. What's up, glory to glory? Father, we arrest the atmosphere. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. We release fresh oil, fresh manna fresh anointing of the Holy Ghost in this house. We honor the man of God of this house. We honor all the leaders of this house. Um, and we know you're doing something phenomenal among the saints. So anoint your man servant even now to speak as of the oracles of God. I rebuke the spirit of error and I release the spirit of truth and of accuracy. Grant your man servant continuity of thought, supernatural flow of speech, that this word may minister life to this your great people and they are indeed a great people will never again be the same in jesus mighty name we pray all that agree said shout glory hallelujah you can be seated in the presence of our god god is great amen there's no god like jehovah I'm so honored to be with you. I've been praying about this service for some time. I honor the grace upon the man of God's life. Our relationship, though it's relatively new, it has a sense of depth and connectivity that I've never experienced like this before. I've never met someone the first time as we're talking we're finishing each other's sentences for ourselves. It's like, it's like I've all, always known you. It's crazy. And you say things, I don't, I don't say, well, yeah, I, I think I just listen to you. I'm like, oh my goodness. There's something about the way you're wired, man of God. There's oil all over you. It's rare to find someone with that much depth in God clothed in humility. Because a lot of accomplished leaders today, they want to make sure you know it. They carry a persona. And I hate saying this. I don't want to start off saying stuff bad or negative. But you do realize we have divas in the ministry. Can we talk? You ain't seen diva, you seen diva in the church. We'll keep it at that. I want y'all to look me over real good. Make up in your mind you love me. We got to go somewhere today. I need to get there. I need to be plugged in to hear the voice of God. I'm grateful and I bear you holy greetings from the house of Jubilee City in Westland, Michigan, former Detroit. It's just a suburb outside of the city. And I'm grateful for my bride of 48 years. No words. To this day, that girl still makes my knees squeeze and my liver quiver. Ha ba 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 shaka. 
my my so she told me to send her greetings she recently had uh, knee replacement surgery so she's not traveling otherwise she'd be here prophesying trust me anyway I'm honored to have uh, one of the guardians we have a ministry in our church called the guardians and they kind of look after us take care of us and, and one of the leading guardians in the house of Jubilee uh, is Steve Carpenter he's with, with me today hallelujah also a friend I've known for many years and God has reconnected us recently pastor Brian Jones and his wife Lynn thank you all for coming with us they already had a time planned here just so happened coincidentally that it's the same time we're here so we're honored to have them here with us well are you ready where we are right now in the body of Christ in our, in our culture at large is a place whereby our culture our nation even to some extent the church is hurting kind of reminds me of a story I heard years ago about a man who was having some health issues and he went to the doctor and the doctor examined him finally said to him take your finger put it on your forehead and press he did okay take that same finger put it on your chin and press ow take that same finger put it on your elbow press it ow he looked at him and said what you have sir is a dislocated finger We have ills in our culture, in our society, in our world, in our families, in your personal life. And we think it's one thing when really it's another. We've misdiagnosed where we are. And somehow in the church, you hear me use the word ecclesia? We're in the age now of the ecclesia, not the church. Now y'all said y'all love me, all right? Stay with me here. So when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, upon this rock, and the rock wasn't him, the rock was the revelation now you're knowing who he is. Why is that important? If you are wrong about Jesus, we don't care what you write about. It's the rock of revelation of knowing who he is. Everything is about him. Our world is about him. He's our redeemer. He's our deliverer. Upon this rock of revelation knowledge, I will build my... The Greek word there for church is ecclesia. When King James identified 40 plus scholars to translate from the scrolls, what we have today, the, New, the King James Version, they did not put ecclesia in what it really, really meant there. Why? For the, what ecclesia means and what Jesus meant then and what we have now in church is not the same thing. That's the problem. That goes back to why we're hurting. Ow, ow, it goes back to that. Because somehow along the way, what he meant then and what we have now has been lost. That's the reason our culture, our world is in the shape that it's in now. So the ecclesia was a body, like a senatorial body that went outside the gates of the city and they met, they conferred, and they came together on what needed to be done to maximize how that city, that region, that province should function. They had legislative authority. They had law enforcement authority. They had economic authority. They had the, the capacity to establish public policy for that region. That was the ecclesia. King James didn't want nobody thinking they could do that. The powers that be today do not want us to move into the anointing, the mantle of the ecclesia. We're busy doing traditional church. In the meanwhile, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. So now, there's an awakening. 
We're in a culture, everybody want to be woke. My response is, unless you awaken to righteousness, go back to sleep. Let me keep it moving. Oops. Y'all said y'all love me. Let me get myself together here. So. I want to talk to you about a message the Lord put in my heart. But Steve, can you come get my pen for me? Entitled, Glory in the House. If anybody understands glory, it ought to be a church named Glory to Glory Ministries. <laughs> glory is greater than anointing. I don't minimize anointing. And we misappropriate what that really, really means. Can't go there now. It's a different message altogether. We misappropriate it to a large extent because we want to put the anointing on stuff that has nothing to do with the kingdom. There's no anointing to win the Bobby Jones Gospel Fest. Ain't no anointing for that. You just sang good. We're glad you could sing. Because we cannot differentiate gift and anointing. Gift makes people feel good. Ooh, just bless my soul. But anointing will rock your world. But glory shifts atmospheres. So this house, I came with a word. This house is a fortified place for this region to shift atmosphere. To address, get hold of this, the ruling prince. I was in my hotel last night late and got up early this morning praying concerning the principality over this region. Hear this. Tampa is a municipality. Every municipality has an assigned principality. Did you get that? We wrestle not. And some saints stop right there. I wrestle not. No, no. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So our enemy is not people. Stop getting mad at people. Stop getting mad at Pookie and Ray Ray them. We're dealing with principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this present world. And there are six of them. Can't go there right now. And spiritual wickedness in the high place. So the ecclesia, the glory, the glory ministries, there's an assignment upon this house because of who your leader is to assault the ruling princes. To break the back of the oppressor do you realize the skills that you have about 11 years ago a movie came out called taken it was about an espionage agent who had retired and he had he had, a, had been divorced and he had a young daughter who lived on the west coast want to spend more time with her so he moved there to spend more time with his daughter that he hadn't had any time with Harley and uh, he didn't realize she had already planned a trip to Europe really to follow a rock band but she said this vacation with my friend Amanda well when they got there they were identified by the underground sex slave trade industry and he told her before she left here's a phone as soon as you get there call me my girl didn't so her dad called her while they're talking, there was an intrusion in the villa they were staying in. And she could see across the villa that there was men taking her friend Amanda. And she said, there's men here and they've taken Amanda. My man knew right away what was up. He, was, he worked on a high level for the CIA. He was highly skilled in explosives, spying, um, martial arts, uh, weapons. Uh, highly skilled and even, even the technology of that, highly skilled. He had a certain set of skills uh, that were very unique. So, when he heard what was going on, he told his daughter, go to the next room, get under the bed, and tell me everything you hear and everything you see. So she did. And the men, the captors, came into the room, said something in their language, then they left. She thought. She told her dad, they're gone now. Second later, they come right back in the room, snatch her from under the bed. She's screaming and hollering. She drops her phone. 
And one of them picks it up. Her father could hear him breathing. He says, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you let my daughter go, there'll be no questions asked. But if you take her, I will come after you. I will find you and I will kill you. Why? He told him, I have a certain set of skills. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. I'm here to let you know. Glory to Glory Ministries. You've got a certain set of skills. Skills that make you a nightmare to the principalities, the powers, the rulers. You're their worst nightmare. Do you know who you are? Do you know what you have? You got skills. Skills in prayer. Skills in worship. Skills in giving. Skills in serving. Skills in loving. Skills in forgiving. Skills in advancing the kingdom agenda. You've got skills. So, in the meantime, other things are going on. I want to look at a passage here out of the book of Romans. And you may now figure out right away, why is this message entitled Glory in the House? When you're reading a, di a different text, when you hear the words of this text, It'll resonate in your spirit. Before I begin to execute and break anything, I just want to read this passage out of the New King James Version. The Apostle Paul writes as follows. Romans 8, 18 through 30, New King James Version. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy. What? Are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Whoa. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to the futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it into, into his, whole, his hope. Verse 21. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of the corruption into the glorious liberty of who? The children of God. Why? For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together. How long? Until now. What? Until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly waiting. What? For the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he can see? Now watch this. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Why? For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. What happens after that? The Spirit himself. Does what? Makes intercession for us with what? With groanings which cannot be uttered. This is so powerful. I can just read this and sit down. Glory to God. Verse 27. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is. That would be God. Why? Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, we don't think or hope, we know. What do we know? All things work together for the good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. What? To be conformed to the image of his son. Why? That we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these 
those, them, those people, glory to glory people, he also grew glory in the house. Now, to get a hold of this, I kind of need to give you a little background of Paul's writing leading up to this passage, this chapter. The book of Romans is really a doctrinal masterpiece. It's the most doctrinal book in your entire Bible. Nothing else is even close. This, this right here, this epistle right here is off the charts. It is a masterpiece. If we can get the essence of the message Paul is conveying in the context of each individual chapter, like in chapter one, he kind of lays things out. The state of mankind without God. And he's making it clear to us, we cannot be ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of salvation. The, these people need to hear the gospel, the good news. So it begins to break down even the reality of who God is, is already in them. Romans 1 says uh, they hold it or they suppress it in their unrighteous state. So the most vile, wicked, belligerent, violent, hateful people you know, hear this, they have a God consciousness. They all do. Think about this. You ever heard someone get angry and use profanity? What are they? I'm not cussing. I'm just making a point. Okay, don't be tripping. All right, I'm from Detroit. All right, but now I hear this. What do they say God's name and then say damn? Why do they got to bring God's name in him? Because they have a God consciousness. That's why. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard anybody get mad? Lose their temper, start using profanity and say, Buddha, damn, dog, Buddha, damn. Who does that? <laughs> Name them for me. You have never heard anybody lose their temper, start cussing and say, Buddha, damn. <laughs> Ever. Have you? I'll wait. Why do they get angry, lose their temper and say, Jesus Christ, this and what? Why is it? What? Why you gotta bring the name of Jesus into your foolishness? Why don't they say, I don't know, Hari Krishna, dog? Hari Krishna. No one gets mad and says, Hari Krishna. No one gets mad and says, A Buddha damn. Why? Buddha didn't die for them. Buddha wasn't raised from the dead for them. Buddha ain't coming back for them. As a matter of fact, one day old big fat butt Buddha is going to bow his knee and say, there's Jesus Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. There's no God like him. We got to be clear about the message. Somehow it's been watered down with cultural ideologies and concepts and ways of thinking and philosophies. They have nothing to do with the word of God. So people aren't getting a real clear message. Romans chapter one brings that out. In a powerful way. Matter of fact, I don't know if there's any place else in Scripture, Bishop, where the Apostle Paul actually says three times in Romans 1, okay, I'm turning them over. And the reason he does is crazy. He addresses more than anything else sexual sin in Romans 1, and in particular, the sin of homosexuality in Romans chapter 1. Yeah, I said the sin. Yeah. Not the lifestyle preference. So what has happened is uh, we're in a culture now that really the tail is wagging the dog, meaning uh, public policy, how we function them, has to center around the feelings of what's called the LGBTQ community. I can get that right now, but there is no such animal. See, unless we're going to come straight from God's word, we're so into feelings. You want to hurt that group's feelings. We don't want to bother their feelings. We don't live by feelings. Jesus didn't deal with people's feelings. He laid the ax to the root. The number one spirit that Jesus dealt with, go read the four gospels, was something called the unclean spirit. 
If you, I did a deep study on the unclean spirit, it was sexual in nature. So el, homosexuality wasn't, isn't anything new, but I want you to think about this. What's happening in our country right now as it relates to what's called gay marriage, if it's gay, it's not marriage. I said it. Look, I, I'm here now. See, we're trying so hard not to offend. We become tolerant of perversion. And it's a plot of the enemy to normalize that which is perverted to make you comfortable with it. So when you get tolerant, a culture, a society is judged by what they're willing to tolerate. Let me keep it moving. Some of y'all said, well, he, he was anointed a little while ago. I don't know what happened to the boy. But when you think about it, especially in the black community, there's this sense that the number one issue we have is racism. I'm not minimizing racism. It's real. It exists. Actually, I look for it. I like kind of, where can I find me some racists at? I don't have time to tell you, I can tell you some stories that'll blow your mind, but what we've done with racism, can't go there right now, cannot deal with that right now, but it'll blow you away. We have come with this victimization mentality. When the Bible's real clear, name all these things, Romans 8. We're what? Not just conquerors. The word, the Greek there says super Nike. So we're super Nikes, the Greek word is Nikeo, we're super hooper Nikeo over everything. We don't lose at nothing. Nothing oppresses me, nothing victimizes me. Watch this, nothing offends me. When you operate in the kingdom, when you know your kingdom citizenship, you are unoffendable. I cannot tell you the last time someone offended me now there have been people who've tried i didn't even know they were trying to offend me i look back and like oh my goodness he was trying to offend me bless his heart <laughs> lord bless the boy he he don't know what's up see god wants you in a place where you're unoffendable guard your heart with all diligence out of it comes the issues of life so when you understand how this works, you see everything through a biblical worldview. You don't see it through the lenses of the culture. You don't think through the lenses of America. You see, see, our citizenship, the Bible tells us, is in heaven. The Greek word in Philippians chapter 3 for citizenship is the Greek word polytuma. We get our word politics from that word. So my political frame of reference comes from the throne of God. I don't worship at the altar of donkeys. I don't worship at the altar of elephants. I worship at the altar of the slain lamb. And when I need him to, he turns into the light of the tribe of Judah. So this changes the game. I don't deal with issues in my culture based upon being a black man. I ain't trying to act like I ain't black. I'm from the hood. I grew up in the projects. <laughs> so don't get it twisted. But I don't function like that. I function as a kingdom citizen. As a new creation in Christ Jesus. So that changes how I look at things. So, so my brethren tell me the number one thing we got going on right now, our problem is we got too much racism and he's a racist and she's a racist and they're a racist. I'm like, and so what do you hear this? Where our country is going, the trajectory of America right now, unless ministries like this one follow the lead of what your pastor is doing, your bishop is doing, the trajectory of our nation is centered around an ideology that's perverted to the very core. And in Romans chapter 1, the apostle Paul nails it concerning the sin of homosexuality when men with men, women with women, doing that which is unnatural. And three times God says to the apostle, I'm turning them over. 
You'll never find the Bible God said he's turning folk over because of racism. What's happening with men marrying men and women marrying women and raising children in a perverted ideology of what marriage is all about has the capacity to fundamentally change who America is. Racism can't do that kind of damage to us. Racism won't do that at all. So Paul, by the Holy Spirit, in Romans 1, is calling this out. Almost no preacher in America is calling it out. But your bishop is. Let the chips fall what they may, where they may. Let the, let the powers that be come after us. All I say is, devil, your mama, we ain't bowing. <laughs> devil, your mama. Hey, yo, I'm from Detroit now, all right? So we got to begin to think from a biblical perspective. In Romans chapter 1, he lays this out. Romans chapter 2, he comes against the religious crowd. Who do you think you are going to judge them? As bad as they are, you got issues too. Whoa. He comes to the conclusion, Romans chapter 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 4, he begins to build the case of faith through the father of our faith, Abraham. In chapter 5, he opens up addressing the fact that we've all been justified by faith uh, after the example he gave in chapter 4. In chapter 6, he makes it real clear the only way to eternal life is through Jesus Christ. If you go any other way, it's eternal death. Then Romans chapter 7 begins to break down how to get victory over the flesh. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Then in Romans chapter 8, he gets, this is a, 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 a theological term called teleos. Teleos. So Romans 8 is teleological. Teleological means... Uh, no matter how things look, at any given time, when it's all said and done, what God is after will come to pass. Okay? There are many passages in nature, because the way that the, the, the language is in the Greek, uh, they're teleological in nature. Romans 8, 28 is one of those passages. Think about that. And we know. We don't think or hope. We know. All things work together. Not by themselves, not independent of one another. All things work together for the good. For who? Them who love God and them who are the call to what? According to his purpose. So when you understand what that really is saying is, uh, no matter what we go through in life, individually or corporately, God has a way of making things by themselves that are horrible, devastating, debilitating, traumatizing. He takes those horrible things up and puts them with things that are amazing, glorious, powerful. And all the stuff in the middle and sovereignly makes them all work together. When it comes out in the wash, at the end of the day, it's for your good. Did you all get that? Stop getting depressed over your present circumstance. We'll get to that momentarily. So God has a purpose. One of my dearest friends in the ministry, we had some precious time together in my home, in his home, sitting in the airports, was Dr. Miles Monroe. He said, Ellis, we've got to get this. He was sitting in my family room, actually. He looked at me and says, Ellis, we've got to get this message of purpose into the hearts and lives of our people. I said, amen, amen, Miles, yes. He said, no, no, no. He had tears in his eyes. He said, no, Ellis, I commission you to do that. He said, don't tell people you got anything from me. He said, there's no copyright. Just make sure you copy it right. <laughs> Those are his exact words to me. But this whole idea of purpose, God has something uniquely crafted and designed sovereignly by him concerning you. To the extent he timed your birth. As to when he needed you in the earth. That's why you weren't born in 1602. God didn't need you in 1602. That's why you weren't born in 1799. God didn't need you in 1799. 
That's why you weren't born in 1812. He did not need you in 1812. Sovereignly. He arranged to have your mother and your father come together in a relationship, whether they are married or not. There may be illegitimate relationships. There's no such thing as an illegitimate child. God, knowing the circumstances sovereignly, caused your mother and your father to meet, no matter what those circumstances were, and to come together in an intimate relationship. At a certain point in time in that relationship, millions of sperm were released, swimming, scratching, clawing, struggling, upstream, just to get to one egg. Only one of them made it. That would be you. God in his sovereignty has kept you alive to be here today. Why? His purpose. See, purpose tells you why you exist. Vision tells you how it's supposed to look. Destiny tells you where you're going. One of the things I learned from Miles, Miles is make sure you let people know there are five questions uh, they must answer. These five questions make the world go round. These are the most important questions you will ever, ever have to answer. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? What must I do? And how will I do it? Those are the most important questions you will ever ask or have to answer. Why am I here? Well, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? What must I do? How will I do it? Each one of those is our teaching by itself. Each one. It carries so much weight to it. So we have people that are struggling in their identity. So when they go through hard times, and we all go through hard times. When they go through opposition, we all go through opposition. When they go through struggle, and we all go through struggle. So how do we get some biblical clarity in the midst of that? In verse 18. The Apostle Paul says, this present suffering cannot be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Now, this word term here, suffering, is a Greek word, pathema. It means something undergone, hardship, pain, affliction, misfortune, calamity. We've all had things in our lives uh, that was a misfortune, a calamity. Something that impacted us in a very negative way, caused us to suffer. Please understand how this works. God is developing character in his people. Character is not a gift. Never pray and ask God to just bless you with character. It's a dumb prayer. It will never get answered. Character is developed by how you handle suffering. How you handle hardship. How you handle rejection. How you deal with emotional pain. How you deal with conflict. How you deal with even situations in the context of your family. Even the context of your marriage. My wife and I are real big on marriage. Do a lot of teaching on marriage. And because of what we do and minister on marriage, ours gets attacked. Whatever you do, please know. Whatever mantra you call, the, the devil comes after that anointing. Why? Good marriages take time. Bad marriages take more time. <laughs> marriage is not give and take. You give and give and give. And you never take anything. When we start taking, somebody's in bed trouble so we go through all kind of issues and different stages and paradigms and different parts of our lives uh, where there's suffering there's a corporate suffering going on right now with this pandemic and it, it, it causes an unsettling and uncertainty some ambiguity and perplexity what's going on now how do we how do we wage through this um, so now we come into a new normal Let's maximize that for the kingdom. Let's let why all things work together for the good. There's some good in this. 
Different message. Uh, but when I said how this works concerning the kingdom and this suffering thing, God is after something greater. He says he works for us uh, glory. What? This word here, glory. If anybody know this, it ought to be you. <laughs> if the first church of the you know where don't get this, glory to glory ministries. Uh, do you know the skills you have? Don't forget. You got skills that makes you the devil's worst nightmare. This kind of depicts it, the meaning in the Greek of the word glory. Doxa. Very apparent. Uh oh, okay. Dignity, honor, praiseworthy, splendor, highness. What? I'm sorry, brightness, magnificence, excellence preeminence majesty that which belongs to god hello glory to glory ministries you are that which belongs to god the very nature of your name has prophetic implications with your assignment in this region you belong to him not the culture not the people not what they want to you belong to him sovereignly wow it means supreme it means the absolute perfection of deity. So what God is after, he's perfecting it in you right now. It means to adorn with luster. Wow. To be renowned, to cause the wrath of the worth rather of a person or a thing to become manifested. So now the true value of this house is about to go to a new level. Why? That's constant. Why? Glory to glory. I said glory to glory. Hello, Doxa. Doxa to Doxa. Glory to glory. Majesty to majesty. Perfection to per. Do you get a hold of what this means to you? Why you're even here, which I'll get to later on. So, verse 18, the word, the glory being revealed in us. The Greek word here for revealed. Oh my goodness is apocalypto which means to take the cover off <laughs> it means to disclose to lay open what has been veiled or cover up to make known uh oh to make manifest watch it watch it to disclose what was unknown before so they didn't know y'all before now there's an emergence, uh, there's a releasing, there's a manifestation, there's an unveiling. Why is this so important? What we call church is one thing, but this is an ecclesia house. One of my dear friends in the ministry was a guy named Francis of Fran Japan. He's uh, Italian when he comes around, it's like the mafia. What are you going to do, eh? Like the mafia coming to your house. But uh, we talk a lot in... He was talking about um, God giving a revelation. This is his, not mine. Uh, he told me to share it, which I am. But uh, he talked about what happened to Paul on a place on a road called the road to Damascus. And he said, Ellis, I sense God's bringing us to a place where he's demasking us. Unveiling who we really are. So the culture can see the heart of God. They can see the face of Jesus. So when Jesus in Matthew 16 told his disciples uh, or asked him, who do men say that I am? When he asked that question, he was at a, at a place called Caesarea Philippi, according to Matthew 16, 13. So he said, and he, and he had to be there. He couldn't be anywhere. He had to be at that spot. What are they saying about me? What's the word on the street? What does Pookie and Ray Ray say about me? He said, well, you're one of the prophets. Jeremiah or Eli is one of the prophets. Uh, he's like, forget about hearsay. Who am I to you? Whoa. And Peter got this revelation, which I already addressed. After he got the revelation, Jesus real clear. Upon this rock. I'll build my ecclesia. Then he said, the gates of hell. 
don't even know if y'all know what he's really saying. He's at a place called Caesarea Philippi. It was a wicked, perverted city. Going into the gates of the city, there was a cavern near the gates. And inside this cavern, going in, it was called the gates of hell. Every diabolical thing you could possibly imagine went on inside of there. Sexual lewdness, uh, idolatry, offering, offering children to idols, which is present-day abortion. All that was going on. They called it the gates of hell. And of all the places to be, he had to be at Caesarea Philippi to even make that statement for them to get it. Because now, if we don't watch it, America is becoming the gates of hell. We come to a place now in our nation where being bold in biblical ideology and biblical worldview and standing what God says concerning family, life, relationships, human sexuality, it's almost like you're the enemy. What you say is hatred. You're intolerant. You're a bigot. The more we preach what thus says the Lord, uh, the way the culture is going, uh, they look at us uh, as the problem, not the solution. So we've got to be real clear about us because things could get worse before they get better. Ask me if I care. Ain't about to change nothing up in here. We got to get a clear view of not who Jesus is. We got this idea that the devil was running hell. He's not. Actually, people pray prayers. I come against the devil in hell. The devil has never been to hell. Now, y'all said y'all love me. He ain't in hell running nothing. He ain't in hell, you know, tormenting people. He's in the earth. Going around. As a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. So we got Christians binding the devil. Well, the Bible says uh, we can bind and loose. Jesus said, whatsoever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Jesus said, whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. He didn't say whosoever. Satan is a whosoever, not a whatsoever. Demons are a whosoever. They can talk. They talk back to Jesus. Our name is Legion. We are many. Whatsoever don't say that. He was anointed. He didn't lost it now. So what does he, what did he mean when he said that? You have a sphere of authority. What Paul called your measure of rule. As you're faithful to that, he enlarges your territory, your measure to rule. That means um, Satan and demons can operate in this realm. Too much glory here. Too much power here. Too much Jesus here. Too much word here. Too much anointing here. So as I'm faithful over that Lord he gives me, he enlarges my territory. That applies to you individually. So there's certain things the devil can't do. Why? He's bound there. Doesn't mean he can't do. He ain't binding the, the devil in China. I hear folk praying. I'd bind the devil everywhere. Where's that in the Bible? You bought that one. We just bind Satan everywhere. You, no, it doesn't work that way. No one has that authority to bind Satan throughout the whole world. What? I bind Satan in Brazil. No. Where's your sphere at? See, we're trying to bind the devil in China when he's running havoc in our neighborhoods. I can't get into what we've done in Detroit because we had, we lived in one of the most, our church was rather, one of the most violent communities, not in Detroit, in America. Well, our church was, you've heard things like Detroit was the murder capital of the world. That was personified at the 48215 zip code. I asked God to give me every school. He gave me every school around there. Nothing happened in those schools without me knowing. Every principal called me. I couldn't keep up. The number one drug dealer became my armor bearer. I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. This is documented. 
the number one hitman in the hood who killed people for a living. He saw one of our young ladies in the mall. And he was trying to, you know, run a little game. She said, you can't even talk to me unless you talk to my spiritual leader. I wasn't an apostle then. I was a pastor, Smith. So he said, okay, I'll come to your church. Like, you know, well, I got to need that. I'll just come. He came on a Sunday morning. The glory hit him. My man never knew what happened. He never knew what happened. He cried through the whole service. When the altar call was given, he was the first one at the altar. He had never heard the power of the gospel, the deliverance, the glory, the anointing rocked his world. So at the service, he came to me and said, we need to talk, sir. I don't know what happened to me, but I'm a changed person. I said, praise God. I'm glad to hear that. He says, no, no, you don't know what I do. Well, let me show whatever you do. No, God loves you. I didn't have a clue. <laughs> this man killed people that we just read about. Police want to talk to me now because I know things no one knows. He confided in me what he's done. Some of the things he shared with me, I actually read them in the paper. She said, I'm leaving all of that. I went and told the people I work for who pay me to do what I do. So he went and told them. Well, I told him, get rid of all your weapons. Because he had them illegally. <laughs> get rid of all your dynamite. He blew houses up, blew cars up. Do everything you do to, and throw it in the Detroit River. And let them know that don't even come back and see me. He came back a few days later. He did what I said. But when he told them, I'm not doing this anymore, they beat him to a pulp. When he walked in my office, his face was disfigured. He said, but I'm not going back. He said, I'm a changed man. I can't get into much, too much detail. We had to help him get a whole new identity, which we did. He actually joined the Navy after that. And he's doing well. I can't get into too much other stuff about that. But the point I'm making is uh, when you claim a territory, this house is territorial. In other words, um, regionally, when you pray, when you worship, when you minister, when you deli bring deliverance, uh, it literally impacts the powers that be. That's why I appreciate your praise and your worship. And this brother right here, this brother right here, seeing a black man on a stage, I don't care who's looking at me, I'm going to get my shout on, I'm going to get my dance on, I'm going to spin around, I'm going to leap, I'm going to... When you have that kind of grace on your life, that's not normal. That's not average. But ain't nobody here called to be average and normal. I got about eight minutes. I ain't even halfway through this message. I ain't even halfway through it. I ain't even got to the main points yet. I've been hanging out the wash. We're going to cut this short, Bishop. Because y'all, your people putting the, you did something. You, 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 my friend. You did something. There's, there's something pulling on me. And it's making me go places I hadn't planned on going. They're placing a demand upon the gift. I'm going to try to keep on my notes here. But when you understand what this revelation actually means and the implications of what's being revealed, to take the cover off, to lay open what has been veiled or covered up, to make known, to make manifest. Verse 19, he talks about all of creation is groaning, eager. And he mentions three groans. I'm not going to go into what I want to go into with these three groans. But there are three different groans here. There's a groan of creation. There's a groan that we have. Then there's a groan of the spirit. I'm not going to break all these Greek words down. I just want to kind of give you an overview of what that involves, okay? Creation is groaning. There are things happening in society, in culture, in weather patterns, with volcanoes, earthquakes, all kind of things going on in the broader sphere of our nation, our world. What's going on with ecology? What's going on in education? Their systems, uh, they're, they're groaning. Why? Why are they groaning so? Why is creation? They're waiting for the real ecclesia, the weos, to show up. 
If you go and study the New Testament in Greek, you'll find there are like five different Greek, Greek words for the word child, son, or children. They're used interchangeably. Pideon, brephos, technon. But the, 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 the highest one is weos. Weos is a mature son. That's the word he used earlier on in this chapter in verse 14. As men are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons. Weos, a mature. So basically he's saying uh, creation is waiting for the ecclesia to grow up. And what we have a lot of good churches, but, but most churches started off this morning at 10 o'clock sharp, and they ended at 11 o'clock dull. No glory, no power, no anointing, no real praise, no real worship, no prophetic grace. Uh, they just do what they do. We've gotten so good at having church, uh, we can do it if God shows up or not. It's almost like, okay, God, we got this. I mean, you're welcome to come if you want to, but we got this. God forbid. Some churches, they're really into the word. Word, 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 word. We believe the word. We, we quote the word. We say the word. We are word, 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 word people. And everything you say, is that in the word, that in the word. They're so dry. Word, word, word. The other churches, they are spirit. Glory to God. They just want to shout and dance and turn chairs over and run. They don't know nothing, but they just want to have a good time in Jesus. If all you are is word, 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 you will dry up. If all you are is spirit, 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 you will blow up. But if somehow we can get word and spirit, you will grow up. I said grow up. So creation is groaning, waiting for us to grow up. Sit. Why? Go back to the book of the beginnings. Genesis chapter 1. God gave us dominion. In the earth. We have authority that we have never really tapped into. That controls atmosphere so god it raised up ecclesias like glory to glory ministries uh, to not be the thermometer for the region be the thermostat for the region you set the temperature nothing goes on educationally socially economically because we we got to have a voice in this thing that's called social justice they're groaning waiting for us to show up why you're not going to like this next statement, but you'll get over it. In the Bible, there's no such thing as social justice. If it's social, it's not justice. The best biblical passage for that is Isaiah chapter 26. When the writer actually says he gives strength to those who turned the battle at the gate and there's gates to every city like Tampa and strength, strength to them and for them it shall be a diadem of beauty a crown of glory and he says he's going to give them the spirit of justice not social you bought that one ask God to forgive you never go back there again it's not the spirit of justice carries something that social justice can begin to address properly. What does that mean? Along with the spirit of justice comes mercy, kindness, compassion, peace, righteousness. Those are attributes of the spirit of justice. The proponents of social justice aren't even qualified to carry that. To carry that, you got to be saved. <laughs> To carry that, you've got to have a relationship with a just God. When you don't understand that, you try to make God fit into the civil rights ideology. He's too big. He's not into civil rights. He's into civil righteousness. Do not get them confused. Do not get them confused. So we can't try to make God fair. I just want God to be fair. No, you don't. 
He don't even say, I shall be a fair God unto thee. That's not even in your Bible. He ain't trying to be fair to nobody. He's just. He's always right. But your God is not fair. The first shall be last is not fair. Never pray and tell God, God, this want my just do. No, you don't. Never pray that prayer to God. God, I just want what's coming to me. No, you don't. It's the dumbest prayer you'll ever pray. Jesus already took at Calvary what was coming to you. He bore your pain. He bore your sorrow. He bore your sickness. He bore your trauma. He took it all in. It was all on him. So... When you understand how this works, God's just, and he's always right, but he's not fair. There was nothing fair about sending Jesus to Calvary. I'm not going to finish this message. I'm just going to turn this off because I got more. If I keep looking at that, I'm going to go there. And I want to kind of respect the time because I haven't gotten to where I need to go. But I want you to understand something. That whole thing about purpose I mentioned earlier. There's a reason why you're in this house. There's a reason why you're under this leader. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, God puts us in the body as it pleases him. He's trying to please you. It, 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 this ain't about you or what, what you want. I like this. No one cares what anybody likes. Anybody what anybody like? It's about his purpose. There's a grace upon this man. There's all upon this man that God has uh, that he wants to infuse into your life. So what's in him can go out into the community, in the region, impact the lives of men and women and boys and girls by virtue of the message you hear here. Now, Jesus actually told his disciples what I do. You can do greater works. He said, no, you will do greater works. What he does, you can do greater. Why? He's only one person. This is going to sound crazy. But you can get a double portion of his grace to do what you do in your sphere. Now, because oh, he does a whole bunch of things. Within your sphere. No, how does that work? You know over there when Elijah is with his protege, Elisha. And Elijah says to him, my dude, what do you want from me? What can I do for you? What do you need me to impart for you? He says, you know what? I would love a double portion of your strength. He's like, whoa, you've asked a hard thing. But if you see me, when I'm caught up, you got it. Can you imagine what Elisha went through during the interim period everywhere elijah went he got to be there elijah trying to go to the bathroom here come elisha right be can i just have some privacy no i ain't missing my blessing no 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 <laughs> everywhere he went here comes elisha finally when the chariot came and took elijah away as he's going away in the chariot he releases his mantle. It fought because he was postured in the right place. He was right at the spout where the glory came out. So the mantle fell on him. He said when it fell on him, father, father, twice. What? He got a double portion. He didn't say buddy, buddy. He didn't say, homie, homie. He didn't say, my dude, my dude. He said, father, father. There's a fatherly grace upon this man. And there's a mantle that comes upon you from him. You've been asking God for too long to give you a double dose of the Holy Ghost. Never pray that prayer again. It's not even in the Bible. A lot of y'all can't even handle a touch of the Holy Ghost. He just touched your behind. You're underneath the chair, knocking chairs over, rolling around. All he did was touch you. What you going to do with a double dose of the Holy Ghost? Are you kidding me? 
Kaboom! There she goes! What happened to her? She asked for a double dose of the Holy Ghost. No such animal is a double portion of his strength. So you've been sent. You didn't just show up here one day. Even though you may feel like that, but God orchestrated your steps to be here. Don't leave your place. Don't let opposition, struggle, friendly fire, any antics of the wicked one cause you to leave your place. He has a place for you. Most, I can't get that right. Most folk think Jesus meant in John 14, I go up here, a place for you. He's talking about heaven. I can go deeper on that right now. I won't. He's not talking about heaven. There's a place for you now. Not a space. Never get space and place confused. When you do, you get spaced out. I'm talking about a place for you, not a space for you. When you understand that, posture that measure of rule that you've been sent with purpose you've been sent to be trained to get developed in what you're called to do you've been sent to draw from the grace the anointing the overflow of what's on this man it's amazing how god set this up if we just obey it <laughs> i don't know just i don't obey the bible it wasn't written for our enjoyment it wasn't written for our getting understanding deeper. You know, all those things are good. It's written for our obedience. Yikes. We don't like that word. I'm my own man. That's our problem. Let me kind of wind this down. You've been sent here. In John's Gospel, chapter 1. The writer is writing some profound revelation. And... He makes this statement in John chapter 1. There was a man sent from God, and his name was John. Now, that concept of a man or woman being sent from God was not limited to the apostle John. And I'm here to let every man know you are a man sent from God. And your name is. Stand up, man. every man, please stand up. Get out in the aisle, come to the altar, get some space. You, you, gotta, you gotta make a prophetic declaration here. So you gotta be in a place where you can move around. I don't want you to hurt nobody. I want you to take a stance. Take your fist and ball it up. Put another fist in front of you. I'm gonna lead you in a declaration. And I want you to say this with authority. I want you to say this with prophetic clarity. I want you to say this with kingdom power. But you're going to say your name. Not the bishop's name. Your name. Because you're sent from God. When you say your name, I want you to bring your hand down and boom. Hit the top of your fist. Are you ready? Get your stance. Make sure I got enough room. Y'all kind of tight. Y'all ready? I said, are y'all ready? Now you gotta let every principality, every power know what's going on here. Repeat after me, but you're gonna say your name. There was a man sent from God and his name was Oh! Something happened in the spirit. Something broke in the spirit. Now, men, one more time. Now that you got this, uh, blow the roof off this place. I want to hear a thundering sound. I want to hear a glory to glory sound. Are you ready? Say this with me. There was a man sent from God. And his name was. Oh, 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 My God, my God. Now, men, we got to hear from the ladies.
Go back to your seat. Women, y'all come up. Get in the aisle. Come to the altar. Now, I know y'all gonna make some noise up in here. I know how y'all can be. Y'all put y'all feelings in it. Y'all put y'all emotions in it. Come on, come on, come on, ladies. Uh, anointed women of God. Uh, glorious women of God. Uh, we need you. We can't go where we need to go. But come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come a little closer, a little closer, a little closer. Le bobo shata baba baka. Ro bobo shata da baba baka. Ro bobo shata baba baka. Le bo shanda de le bo sha. Le bo kro bo shata ba. Oh, 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 oh. Le bo shanda kle bo sha. Oh, oh. Ladies. You're going to do the same thing. You're just going to lift your hand in the air when you say your name. Put your hands down when you say your name. Loud. Are you ready? Now you're going to say, there was a woman sent from God. And her name was. Are y'all ready? Now you got to say this with a little attitude. Say this like you want every devil, not in hell, but in this region. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, robo shata ba 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 baka. Let it be shata ba ba ka. All right, 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 ba 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 sha. Are you ready? There was a woman sent from God, and her name was. Ooh, oh, 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 oh. My goodness, I hope you enjoyed that word. Glory in the house. I don't know about you, but I can feel the glory through the screen, all right? What an awesome word. Apostle, you, you. <laughs> Thank you for allowing God to flow through you and to use you. What an awesome word. Jubilee, remember, next Sunday is going to be glory in the house at Joy Manor, 1030 a.m. Come on out and let's experience his glory together. Until then, have a wonderful week.